Hi, my name is Juan Sebastián Torales. I'm the director of Alma Mula, my first feature film, premiering on the Berlinale uh, in the Generation section. Padre, you know I've ever seen my love by love. Desviadito. Basta, chicos. Vas a estar bien aquí. Vos lo consientes mucho. Por eso es tan blandito. Confirmandos, él es Nino. En eso lo están desnudando. Son hombres. No los quiero cerca del monte. ¿Por qué no? Tú puedes desaparecer como el nieto de la María. Natalia. ¿Me extraña? Claro que le extraña. Cuenta la leyenda que la memoria es una mujer que se acostó con su padre, su hermano, hombres y mujeres del pueblo. Si quieren confirmarse, consideren su cuerpo como un templo. No tienen derecho a asociarlo con deseos impuros. ¿Estás? ¿Me escuchas? Padre tiene razón. Está raro. Mi padre dice muchas cosas. Padre dice verdades. Desde que hablo con él ya no la veo. Aquí. En el mamola. ¿Qué haces aquí vos? No te he dicho que no vengas al monte. ¿Sos vos? Hi, welcome to the Teddy TV. My name is Jean Bor Bobak, and this time we are discussing the film Alma Mula. Hi, welcome to the Teddy. Welcome to the Berlinale. Um, thank you for being here with us. Um, maybe let's start with with Alma Mula. Who is Alma Mula? What is this legend uh, exactly? And how did you encounter for the first time this legend? Um, so. For the Amamula, there's a lot of versions. Um, some say that the Amamula is a legend created by the Holy Inquisition. Okay. Um, when they arrived to South America with the colonists, they, discovery, they, they discovered indigenous people um, mm -hmm. that in general used to live their sex sexuality freely. Yeah. So not only they punished them because of their immoral acts, but they created the legend to make them fear and stop doing what they're doing. Immoral acts, uh, yeah. let's say. <laughs> what the church thought that they, mm -hmm. it was immoral acts. So um, they created this legend that is about uh, this woman punished uh, by God because she had sexual relationship, relations with his, her father, her, her brother, and men and women from the, from the village. Mm -hmm. So God transformed her uh, into a monster who lives in the forest. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, we'll never know if she was raped by his father, by her father. We'll never know if she was simply attractive or naturally sexual. I think she would have been punished anyway because she was a woman. Let's say. <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite so. Yeah, 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 it's a very interesting point. If you take this to the, to the actual time, um, you can have a long debate. <laughs> so Certainly. first, I found that very interesting. Um, so um, the, the first time I heard about it, it was when I was 12 or 13 years old. And I had a lot of trouble in school for being a little bit delicate. A little bit sissy mm. <laughs> and different, let's say. So I used to go with my dad every day to our house in the countryside to escape a bit. Yeah. So um, and I would love to, to to talk and exchange with the locals, mostly indigenous yeah. people. Uh, I would play in nature. So that's when I I discovered the legend. I heard about it uh -huh. uh, and it fascinated me. I I wanted to find her in in the in the forest, you know. Yeah. So. So from that age, I discovered that my hometown, my hometown had this very rich culture on mystic and folklore. So uh -huh. that is part of the process. Then, then is 
I like to think of scripts as, as, as a basic story, like something yeah. inspired in something that should happen to you. Yeah. And you give a fantastic turn. You turn it into a tale. You take it from something ordinary to a step forward yeah. or something different. And, and then you can tell that story to your nephews or your, your grandsons. Yeah. I don't know. That's how I... Uh-huh. And yeah, it's like a love letter to 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 a ch- the child that lived inside of me. And mm-hmm. yeah, but it's very interesting Perfect. what you say because obviously there are a lot of parallels with um, with with your main character, uh, what he is going through in this film. Like it, it really seems to echo a lot of those things that you just said. Um, so I assume that it was a very personal, very yeah, yeah, yeah. sense. Yeah, it was crazy. It was like I started writing Alma Mula eight years ago. Uh, it was a moment where I I was feeling very comfortable in my life. Yeah. I was settled in Paris. It was 12 years I was living in Paris already. I left Argentina. Mm-hmm. And I started, I, everything was very calm. I was, I was very comfortable. So I said, let's get in trouble. <laughs> so I started nice. thinking about my goals in life. So I reconnected with this child inside of me, the one who dreamt to make a movie mm-hmm. some, someday. <laughs> Yeah. And so I started writing about these wounds from the past and and that's how Alma Mula was born. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that's that's very fascinating. I was really wondering um about how did you find Nicolas Diaz to play the role of Nino obviously like this part is like the heart basically of the film. So so a lot hinges yeah. on on a, on a good choice. For, for an yeah. actor. Each time I talk about Nicolas, I have the chills. <laughs> yeah. Because it was it was a it was yeah very special very special encounter. We we started uh, this casting mission uh, in my hometown to find the boy who could play this role, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we thought it could be the most typical thing ever because of the my hometown is quite conservative, very Catholic, and you know. Who will yeah. let his son do this role? <laughs> yeah. So we thought it was going to be very difficult, but we were wrong. Gladly, yeah. it was the the easiest thing. We we made an open call, and Nicolas was one of the first kids that came to the casting. Almost two thousand people came to the casting. The response was amazing. Yeah. And he was one of the yeah one of the first kids we saw. And I said. This kid is very special. He's, uh, he's, he has so many emotions happening now in this moment present. And we were, we were really moved and shocked because he, he did two scenes from the movie and with no experience, never in front of the camera. And yeah. he, he, he did it like perfectly uh, as I imagined. No, uh-huh. better because I, I didn't have an idea of how, how I wanted Nino to be. Yeah. So I said, it's him. <laughs> the thing is, we started the casting. It was the first week, yeah. and I said, "But no, this is this can be true. We have to keep on looking. We will we, we'll find better things, mm, yeah. maybe." <laughs> and, and no, we did three months more, uh, and we didn't find some someone better than him. He was pure emotion. He while we was we were shooting the film, he used to look at me and t- and, and tell me what's wrong. Something's wrong with you, <laughs> or oh, are you feeling fine? You're happy now. It's like he's always he knows what happens with everyone, so mm-hmm. it's very easy to connect when you're acting. Yeah, he used this this tool that he has naturally with with the other actors, and incredible. Yeah. He never act. He never did this. So, and the most important thing is his family. They read the script, a very explicit uh, script. Mm-hmm. It was very hard to say no, my my son cannot do this. Right. <laughs> but the response was was incredible. They told us I think that we think that this film is necessary uh, and and that our son we're proud that our son has been chosen. So it was the easiest thing in the end. Amazing. Yeah. That's, uh, that's <laughs> absolutely wonderful. Um tell us a bit about how you visually constructed the film. As you said it it goes with this legend there are like quite um fantasy elements um in in the in the 
textual part of the film. Um, so I was wondering what was your vision behind it? Um, first of all, I didn't want it to make like a gender, gen <laughs> gender film, a genre <laughs> film. Yeah. <laughs> um, even if I'm a big fan of genre film, I love horror films. It's something mm -hmm. I, I, I like. Um, that was the first idea I wanted to do. A, yeah, a mix of all I, I love, all the kind of films I, I, I like. And I consider Almamula Al as a very instinctive project. Like, okay. uh, I spent, for example, two years, the last two years, almost without watching film. I didn't want to watch any mm -hmm. film, to, not to be... Uh, um, you know, to have a Influence. lot of images or uh, yeah. mm -hmm. to, um, I really wanted to start from scratch, but maybe only with all the references I already had in my head, all the films I love and all that, that stuff. Um, and I think everything, every, every single film I love is a little bit in Almamul, of course, but in an unconscious way. I, I was not trying to make any homage or yeah. to emulate anyone, but instead keep this very spontaneous way of writing and creating. Mm -hmm. And and actually, everyone who joined the project, I told them not to ask for reference. <laughs> yeah. Come with new ideas, come with things. Uh, uh, we wanted to do everything from zero and try to have an original object because... We were shooting in a place where there's no industry, no cultural scene. Mm -hmm. Most of these people were not actors, so we took this more um, as a um, as a force than a, an obstacle. Yeah, we, we were very happy, but also detached from what we were supposed to do or how a first feature film should look like. Yeah, um, and and tried to rely on our instincts. Yeah, mm -hmm. and work with what what we had. Yeah, with the elements we had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you say yeah. that you worked a lot with um, with the local communities. Um, how was that work, and how important was it for you to like incorporate um, the communities into this project? Um, I come from a, a city in, in Argentina, which is considered like a lazy, okay, lazy place. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you have that in Germany, but we are considered the, considered the most lazy. Uh, community in Argentina and I wanted to prove that wrong uh -huh. so um, I, I I really proved that when you when you have yeah there's, there's maybe a, a sleeping community but they just needed to be waken up and and we did it the, the project was uh, was like a big motivation for for all these people and they were excited everyone was helping it was Mm. It was a beautiful process, yes. Yeah. It was interesting to see as well that um, this environment in which uh, the film takes place, um, it sort of becomes its own protagonist in the film, um, that it really uh, leaves a mark on kind of like um, the rhythm of the film, like you can almost feel the heat, um, this very humid environment and everything. Can you tell us a bit about this aspect of the film? Yeah, yeah. I always thought of Alma Mula as a sens sensorial, how do you say it? Sorry. Mm, sensorial. <laughs> sensorial yeah. um, film in which, yeah, you're, you're, you're very stick, you stick to emotions and feelings and yeah, this heat and mm -hmm. All you just mentioned uh, it can be interpreted like that but we try to show the landscapes for example you talk about landscapes and spaces where it happens but there's just in some particular moments in the film mm -hmm. uh, just to settle a little bit the place where it happens but it, it was not the first idea we, we just want to settle and the rest is feeling it's just emotion it's what you feel from the from the screen and because for me, Alma Mula is more um, um, about a film about uh, human beings, yeah. human emotions, and about trying to figure out this human emotion. So that is why the camera is always very close to the bodies. And, mm -hmm. and I avoided, I avoided uh, showing beautiful landscapes uh, most of the time. Uh, it's, not, it's not a look how beautiful this location mm -hmm. is movie, you know, it's... <laughs> It doesn't rely on that. My priority here is being close to the characters and, and trying to understand what they feel and and think. Yeah. But as in real life, you, you don't really know what people are thinking. 
So that's why yeah, that's for sure. I imagine like that. Mm. I don't know if if I answer your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you absolutely. Thank you for being so open about it. Um, also, what was um, a very integral part to this narrative is this um, a very interesting conflation of superstition and religious convictions um, and how those kind of frame um, the relationships that people have with each other or with themselves even. Um, can you explain a bit about this uh, very interesting mix of these superstitions and religious convictions that, that are so prominent in the film? Mm, well, I put both in the same stage. I mean, um, that's a difficult one. <laughs> what, um, what I tried to do in the film was to expose these two realities, the yeah. one that Nino is forced to live, so his, his mother's, the church, the confirmation ceremony and all that, and the one that Nino wishes to live, uh, the fantastic one with the Alma Mula, let's say. So um, this balance was a bit hard to do because I wanted, I wanted the audience to do their own idea and not underline things and or saying this is good, this is bad. Um, that was the most difficult part, and that's why your your question is a bit difficult. Mm. <laughs> but no, to be honest, for me, if you want my point of view, yeah. uh, any form of religion or political ideology or dogma or whatever is conditioning uh, human behavior, for me, is not a good thing. So, uh, but it's not because the characters in Alma Mula are Catholics or Republicans yeah. or whatever; they're bad people. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, Alma Mula is a film in which its characters are constantly struggling for an, for an, an ideal, a principle, something mm -hmm. they believe. And they use this as a, as a shield because they, they're scared. <laughs> yeah. um, because without this protection, they don't know how to be happy. So we right. human beings, we are, I think, we are looking for happiness constantly and we, we are often frustrated because we, we don't find it most of the time. <laughs> Yeah. So some yes, but not everyone. Therefore, they they hold on to religion. They hold on to whatever they have, mm -hmm. but disconnecting to what is really happening. Uh, for instance, Nino's mother, for example. Yeah. Uh, she's completely disconnected of to her son's feeling because she's so dominated, but by, by this religious doctrine. Yeah. And this takes her out of reality and yeah, disconnects her from her son. Uh, mm. Yeah, and on the other hand, you have the, the mystical side with the forest and the Alma Mula so necessary is for whoever wants to open their mind and tell themselves that something else exists, you know, not only what life has teached us now, yeah. uh, till now, I mean, and, and all this has certainly not worked. I mean, Jesus died and come back to save us all and look where we are. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I mean, um, also in that, in this sense that you just mentioned right now, like the Alma Mula, which is um, in this legend and in this community is like kind of imagined as this monster. Um, for someone like Nino, who is like pushed onto the margins by these communities for being the way he is, um, for him, it becomes something else and maybe something that's not to be afraid of, but more something that you would want to welcome. So that was a very interesting dynamic that's going on um, with this with this idea of the Alma Mula. Um, can you talk a bit about this? Because I, I thought that that was very fascinating, this, um, this double dynamic. Yeah, yeah. And we go back to the first question you, you, you asked me about the Alma Mula. She, I told you this, this woman. Yeah. I, I think of women as a minority. As I, I don't want to put them at the same level as homosexuals, but you know, in the oppressing mm -hmm. thing about the, the yeah. men dominating the Oppressed world. And the patriarchy, I sure. put ourselves in the same level and we, we help each other. I mean, that's why the Alma Mula has this feminine shape. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And and I think for Nino is her salvation because they they care for each other and they understand each yeah. other and and yeah I I think um, yeah 
email is the future. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, I think it's, I could say that, yeah. yeah. And I don't know if I answer, answer your question, but for me it's... Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, you also draw a lot upon religious iconography. It, mm. it felt like that it's something that um, this religious imagery that you can see in churches um, and so on and so forth. Um, this was really uh, somewhat influencing you and uh, this was something that like excited you from, a, from an artistic visual point of view. Um, how did you incorporate this into, into the fabric of this film? Well, for me, it was <laughs> it's a long story. Let's say uh, it's a story that started when I was a kid, uh -huh. and that the well, it has been transforming uh, with the years yeah. and the way I see things and religious symbols till now. Um, one of the strongest images I have when I in my head when I was a kid was the the, the crucified Christ. Yeah, this long muscled and half naked man <laughs> um, and me discovering my sexuality at that moment and this image was in each room of my house uh -huh. um, so it's quite it was quite disturbing and, and exciting um, but <laughs> with the time I stopped believing in God uh -huh. uh, but I, I I keep on holding to, to things and symbols yeah. That makes that take me close to to the ones I love uh, and the ones who are connected with me. Um, processing fact for me are my my connection with my with my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> and in some way, um, I wanted this to be present on the film. Everything is, is in some way connected, and that's why Anamula is also a love letter to the ones I love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, we kind of like um, touched upon this that obviously like Nino was um, sexual awakening is is like a crucial and well stated part of the film but through this figure of the alma mula through uh, through the figure of the mother of this um, of these other women in this town uh, the figure of the father like there is quite a lot of um, reflection on gender roles um in this film um what uh, what did you wanna um tell about 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 this about this kind of like gender hierarchy um that the that is actually very present in the film it's not overstated but it's constantly present yeah okay uh that's another difficult one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll try to be precise. Uh, I let's say I consider the characters in Armamula like vessels to to um, to tell Nino's story. Yeah. Well, not only vessels, and more than that, but um, they're middle high class, a bit decadent, and they decided to come to this environment where they they feel powerful and respected. Mm -hmm because they're white and they're surrounded by indigenous people, <laughs> los, los negros, the black people, how yeah. they call them. Yeah. Um, and I always found, find this, this encounter very interesting, you know, these two different wor worlds, but not because uh, one is rich and the other is, is poor. Uh, it's because for some indigenous uh, people, they, they think uh, of men who are more feminine or women who are mm -hmm. more masculine or simply homosexual. But you can be feminine and not be homosexual, of course, but right. they used to look at us as, um, as magical beings, that they had two souls. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. uh, and they were respected in the tribe and celebrated, you know, in yeah. their tribes. So... They have this vision of life so different to what we citizens have learned through the years and which brings so much violence and hatred against minorities. So mm. um, for me to show this clash of universes was more than necessary to, to, to channel and also because they are both things that they're both things that I know very well. I mean, so yeah. I, I felt that it was very 
normal for me to talk about that. And and yes, then there's the this, this gender. Um, I don't think about all these characters. For me, Nino uh, is not an homosexual boy, for example. For me, Nino, Nino is, a, is a young guy uh, struggling with his sexual awakening, with his sexual drive, a very powerful one. And I don't care if he's gay. I don't care if he likes uh, dogs or whatever. I, I, I think of him like someone who's trying to deal with his sexuality. And every single character in the film is, is doing the same. I mean... You can even think that his father could be gay, you know? He never touches her, his wife in the whole film. He never has a, a hint of, of tenderness against with, with, her, with her wife, with his wife. So uh, I see the world like this. Everyone is, we are all human beings. I don't put a gender. I don't, it's, it's the way, the same way I see my characters. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, Luisa Lucia Paz, she plays the role of Maria. Yeah the the indigenous woman who works works in the in the house um and luisa is an icon in my hometown she's a mm. 60 year old trans woman mm. uh, and for me it's it's maria she's i don't care if she's a trans woman or yeah. whatever she she's what it is and and yeah that's the way i i thought about the 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 gender uh -huh. roles and yeah the Hierarchies in in the film, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if if yeah. it's, it was a yeah. question, but yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned this, and it's indeed very, um, very dominant in the film. This clash of these two different universes and these two different cultures m meeting each other. And there was this uh, one particular moment in the film that I uh, thought was super exciting um that it came up that nino's father is working in this forest exploitation farm business mm -hmm. um and then um and then maria this uh, this character that you just mentioned um she's saying to the wife that oh like ernesto the father like he's losing his soul by kind of doing this work mm -hmm. and uh, she very often mentions that yeah like the forest does certain things and it's like mm. it it almost as if there is a bit of this um and that's what i meant by by the nature as protagonist as well that somehow from the indigenous community there is this need to like work together with the nature to respect it to to yeah, yeah to coexist whereas yeah, from yeah. this other culture there is something completely different coming in with yeah, that yeah, can completely. you tell a bit about this yeah so of course um you're, you're you're right you said it you said it everything i just can add some notes <laughs> yeah please um yeah for me uh, nature became a minority too mm. today it's been destroyed like uh <laughs> Yeah. Like uh, yeah, any other minority, violent, violented. We say I don't know how violated, you say it. Violated, yeah, yeah. And for me, it was natural to not. I, mean, I couldn't avoid this this mm -hmm. this subject. They live in a natural environment with this forest, and that is something that is happening today in my hometown. I think this film will be like a. a I don't know how to say, it, but. Uh, a souvenir of mm. what the forest used to be because yeah. it's a very special forest i don't know if you noticed the, the branches are quite yeah, creepy it's, it's very expressive. and it's disappearing so yeah, yeah. and uh, all the people living in this in this place are are between two um, yeah two sides the one that the ones that protect it and the ones that destroy it destroy it because they need to work and they need to eat yeah <laughs> So, uh, and, and yeah, of course, for me, it was, it was natural to, 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 to portray this in the film. And, 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 and as you said, it's very, very present. Yeah, yeah. of course. Great, Juan Sebastian, thank you so much. Um, it was very lovely talking to you. Um, yeah, and I wish you all the best for the Berlinale. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you there.